before I introduce the ambassador, I just want to give him and, and our guests a, a sense of who the audience here is. And, and so we'd just like to ask uh, anyone who has actually spent some time in Japan, if you'd be so kind as to raise your hand. OK. Uh, people who speak Japanese. <laughs> so you may have seen, Mr. Ambassador, as you came in to BYU, there's a sign at the entrance that says, the world is our campus. Uh, and, and it's something that we take very seriously. Uh, one other uh, Kennedy Center uh, uh, announcement. Uh, you may have discovered when you sat down that there was a little card for you to, to fill out. Uh, this allows us to keep in touch with you and let, let you know about uh, events and, and other things that are coming up. So please fill it out and, and leave it with us when, when you leave. Uh, there will also be a drawing for fabulous prizes for those that uh, participate in that. And so you, you may be interested in doing that. So again, it's my pleasure to introduce His Excellency Kenichi Rosase, who was appointed Japanese ambassador to the U.S. in November of 2012. Prior to his appointment, he was the vice minister at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Tokyo and deputy minister for foreign affairs. Previously, he served as director general for the Asian and Oceania Affairs Bureau, director general for the Economic Affairs Bureau, and deputy director general of the Foreign Policy Bureau. Deputy Director General for the Asian Affairs Bureau and Executive Assistant to the Prime Minister for Foreign Affairs. He has also held positions at Japanese embassies in the United States and in the UK and at the Permanent Mission of Japan at the International Organizations in Geneva. Ambassador Sasae entered the Japanese Ministry of Foreign Affairs in 1974 after graduating from the University of Tokyo. Uh, his remarks today are entitled The Current Japan-U.S. Partnership. Uh, after his remarks, we'll have a little time for uh, question and answers and discussion with the audience. So without further ado, Ambassador Sasae. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Rasen, for the uh, kind introduction. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm very happy to be at uh, BYU. Uh, um, I thought uh, I felt like uh, speaking in Japanese, since most of you do understand and possibly you better understand rather than my English. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, this is a great place, and uh, looking uh, from, uh, from the airplane, beautiful scene. This is the first time I come into the town. It's a great city. And, uh, Back in Washington, um, the Cherry Blossom Festival uh, has just started, and it's building uh, for the uh, uh, blooming uh, uh, peak period, peak uh, days. And the uh, festival, uh, with lots of events, is a very busy time for Japanese ambassador, you could imagine. And I tell people that when the uh, Cherry Blossom uh, comes out, so do I. Uh, you know. Uh, I show up with the pink ties, and uh, my uh, wife sitting there wearing the pink dresses, and the town is pink. Uh, but I was told yesterday pink is the color of man in Salt Lake City in the history. But, um, you know, uh, and uh, if I could uh, stay longer uh, on your campus, or, you know, uh, I'd like to uh, hike the why. I saw the why. Uh, it's a great uh, symbol of youth, young, right? Uh, and uh, I want to be young too, I mean, here uh, in this <laughs> campus. And, uh, I heard uh, it was a popular thing to do or, uh, and to, uh, to hike this way. And uh, my wife and I love to hike. I also read that uh, bridge jumping uh, is popular with BIU. <laughs> A student in the summer. Right? Too bad uh, that uh, I could not uh, show you what I could do. I mean, uh, <laughs> <laughs> right, but uh, it's not uh, still uh, warm enough to do it. <laughs> but today um, I want to talk uh, about the bridges of uh, another thought. Uh, not a bridges you jump off, but uh, bridges that you build. Uh, in the words, I'd like to uh, speak about uh, our alliance and Japan-U.S. relationship. What's good and what's bad? What, is, uh, what are the challenges uh, before us? And in short, I would say 
our alliance is in pretty good shape. Uh, I've been ambassador for the past uh, two years and uh, four months, and uh, day by day, month by month, and year by year, and um, it's uh, getting good. And uh, you might think that I'm saying this since I'm ambassador and uh, making propaganda, I mean, uh, and but uh, that is true. And uh, and I and I also had the added advantage that I actually believe it. I mean, uh, you have to believe it when you say something. You you know you have to believe it. Otherwise, uh, you don't uh, get the heart of the people. And I think most expert on Japan-U.S. relations also uh, that to be true. You know, there are lots of experts in Washington, and also uh, Dr. Ringer is an expert on our career, but uh, uh, you know, uh, our relationship is very sound. I don't say that there is no problem, but it's pretty good. And um, there are three dimensions uh, of this progress I'd like to tell you today. Uh, first, uh, you have you heard the word American uh, debalancing uh, policy uh, toward Asia, and that is uh, uh, try to put more focus on Asia as a future potential uh, where there is a more American emphasis or energy poured in. Not only because Asia Pacific and Asia is the area where there is a more potential future economic growth and prosperity, but more so in terms of uh, strategic implication to America's uh, interest. I mean, I would say strategic interest. And that does mean that America will be uh, you know, not paying uh, sufficient attention to the other part of the world. So some of you who might be in, uh, on a mission to Japan and Korea and other parts of Asia, uh, I don't know what you feel, but uh, there is, Asia is full of potential. And, um, and so it's right for American policy is uh, paying much attention to Asia these days. And, but I want to emphasize that, that American uh, debalancing policy is taking place in parallel with the strengthening of our alliance. This is a very important point. Uh, in parallel uh, with strengthening the alliance uh, between Japan and the United States. Without that, uh, this rebalancing policy is very much, uh, you know, um, unbalanced and unstable. Mm. Second. I want to say there has been a deep and broad uh, co policy collaboration and taking place. We uh, talk about almost everything on global issues, regional issues, bilateral challenges, political, diplomatic, security, economic, even social issues like uh, women's uh, issues, uh, women's status, and all the things between the two countries. And every issue is on the discussion topics. And uh, we are addressing almost every aspect of the nation's life. So th this level of uh, coordination is deep and amazing. Third, I would like to say that um, this uh, is a foundation of whatever we do. And the relationship between the two governments <coughs> and also the relationship between our peoples. And this bond we call in Japanese kizuna. Uh, some of you do uh, get what I'm saying in Japanese. Uh, this bond we, we call it kizuna is very strong. There are lots of exchanges taking place uh, between the uh, two people. And uh, especially uh, you know, people uh, here, today's audience, have uh, a lot of experience uh, you know, carrying you uh, to, to the missions. And, and uh, through all these uh, activities, I know that uh, you have a lot of uh, kizuna. 
relationship. Relationship matters. So um, let me talk a bit more in detail about each aspect of this relationship. Uh, first, the uh, rebalancing of American uh, policy <coughs> toward Asia. Uh, there are several dimensions. Uh, first, let me talk about the economic dimensions. Uh, as you know, possibly, Japan has been uh, suffering for many years for economic stagnation. Uh, yeah, we had uh, great economic growth throughout the 60s, 70s, 80s. But somehow in the 90s, uh, we had uh, uh, suffered a lot, economic stagnation. And two decades, uh, our economic growth was not there. We are stagnant. And uh, whatever the nation's uh, standing, a nation's foreign policy, or even defense policy, uh, will be weak, uh, to be honest, without a strong economic basis. That also applies to the United States, by the way. It's not uh, uniquely uh, uh, to Japan. And, but somehow, you know, uh, everything is relative. American economic recovery is quick. And ours is still slower. But on the whole, we are coming back. And um, uh, when we were stuck, is this for me? Or, uh, um, you know, uh, some people, especially uh, around, uh, around Japan, thought that Japan is a declining power. Now, when the economy is stuck, people think that way. Uh, you know, some people believe it. Uh, for that reason, I think the fact that uh, uh, our economy, Japan's economy, is now coming back is very important. And in terms of our standing in the region and also uh, globally. Uh, it is so-called uh, Abenomics. Perhaps some of you might heard this. And Prime Minister Abe is now uh, waging uh, his own uh, uh, policy and, uh, and his policy is beginning to, to show its effectiveness on the, uh, whether it is macroeconomic policy and uh, financing, monetary, and all these uh, structural policies. Uh, the economy recorded uh, two consecutive uh, quarters of ne negative growth actually since uh, last uh, spring then return to uh, positive growth in the final quarter. Uh, that, lots of debate on why that happened. Uh, initially, when I came to Washington two years ago, our economy was uh, bouncing back. But suddenly, when you were growing, coming back, and there was this stagnation. One aspect, uh, one reason for that was introductions of uh, consumption tax that was giving some depressing impact on the consumer mind. So uh, we had a uh, little setback. Uh, but then the prime minister made a decision uh, to, uh, to, uh, to postpone another level of uh, introductions of uh, consumption tax. That was designed before. But he, he made a decision to uh, postpone the reintroductions of another level of, uh, of a tax. And then that uh, gave the some uh, room uh, for the companies. And, and, and then the impact of all this macroeconomic policy and the financing policy began to uh, make impacts. And uh, for the first time in this spring, uh, major Japanese companies are uh, making a lot of profits. And for the first time, uh, you know, they are giving more wages uh, to the workers. That's a great thing to see. If they are giving more wages, they feel like uh, spending more, and that would uh, increase the demand, and that would help the company to sell. So all this, uh, you know, uh, cycle, business cycle, 
is once again coming back. It's a good news. And uh, mm, so at this moment, uh, uh, we are waiting to see how the Japanese uh, economy will be sustained in the coming months uh, and years. Uh, that's a challenge, but it is not always easy. And an important thing is that our government is tackling uh, these uh, economic issues uh, seriously. Now on the U.S. side, you know, although economic recovery is underway, there are some problems, perhaps you hear. Uh, but American economy, as I told you, is, uh, is better compared to Europe, uh, Asia, some, most of the Asian countries in Latin America. The Chinese economy continues to grow, but uh, uh, slower pace now. Uh, uh, American economy is relatively in better shape. So I think that uh, the problem of the United States is not totally economic, but rather political. It includes some of the mindset of the people. And my hope as an ambassador uh, is for America uh, to compromise itself and deliver something at home. And I'm uh, talking about all this uh, partisan debate in Washington. When you go to uh, places, uh, uh, you know, like, um, you know, uh, Idaho or Missouri, I, I travel a lot these days. And, uh, you know, uh, a couple of months ago, I went to, uh, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> Cancers and, and Missoula, people say it over there. And they say that what's happening in Washington, D.C. is not real America. <laughs> and, uh, and that could be. But uh, some of the decisions taken there would affect all of us. So uh, we like to see and, uh, some of the delivery. It's okay to debate about the leadership. Uh, the president might not be uh, popular around here, possibly, or I don't know, but, uh, uh, but uh, he's doing uh, relatively good, good on the economic front. I would talk about foreign policy, possibly. Uh, he's not uh, well pop popular in some, some places in the United States. But the point is that the politician leadership need to deliver. You could talk and declare, but you have to show the result, that, what is, uh, that is what needed in the United States today. And, uh, and that also you know, applies us too. And uh, we each need to deliver some tangible result, especially on the economic front. I think the uh, optimism is that uh, uh, possibly we would do better in the year ahead and two or three years ahead. And uh, that would make our country strong. And a uh, strong Japan and United States is a basis of our collaboration and also our impact on the other part of the region. Well, I think another aspect of the uh, progress on, the, uh, on our alliance, uh, especially in the economic domain, is a trans-Pacific uh, partnership negotiation. You know, um, this is the uh, effort to establish a new uh, trade, new free trade uh, economic uh, area in the Asia Pacific with new principles and real rules governing the uh, 21st century. And uh, this is a very strategic undertaking. Not purely uh, this would uh, increase the uh, job and, and opportunity of export uh, for the United States. It's more of the symbol of American interest in the region and American involvement and commitment uh, to the regions. That matters. Uh, when you say American rebalancing, you have to show that you are committed and so the concrete manifestations of that is the conclusions of these uh, negotiations uh, now undertaken. And uh, now um, we are more or less uh, coming to the ending phase of this negotiation. 
every negotiation is difficult to begin and to end. You know, uh, it also applies to every relationship. It's always difficult to begin the relationship. And also sometimes you have to end, and it's hard. And, and I think we are now coming into a very difficult moment for that reason. And, um, and here is sitting my wife. Would you do me a favor? Would you give me a bottle of water? My voice is becoming horsey, like, uh, like uh, Mark Rubier who was asking for <laughs> that water. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now, about this uh, <clears throat> uh, Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership Negotiation, and the parties are trying to maximize their position and trying to read the red lines of the others. You have to find out uh, which is the bottom lines of each other. I think uh, that's normal in every negotiation. That's the same as business negotiations, in, uh, you know. And this uh, Mr. Freud Murray, who is sitting right over there, close friend of mine, who has been doing a lot of business and knows all this, right? Mm -hmm. You have to figure out what are the bottom price you have to address. But um, we need to conclude this, this talk. Uh, and um, the negotiators are doing their best to get this done. And at this juncture, and uh, we have more work uh, to do. Mm. Uh, and I think an important part of this exercise is that our bilateral negotiations influence and define and the course of all other negotiations. There are other important countries negotiating with each other, but it's often the case the pace of these negotiations is set by leading countries like the United States and Japan. Uh, that's why we, uh, Japan and United States, are responsible uh, to finish negotiation and appeal uh, to the Congress that this is a strategically important agenda we need to finish. And that's why we support U.S. government effort uh, to get a negotiating mandate uh, called the Trade Promotion Authority, or TPA, people call. And that is, uh, that is uh, something we need. We sense the American government is working hard, appealing to the Congress and the Senate, and some people worry that the trade issue could be subject of a partisan debate, as you hear on some of the issues like uh, immigration, Obamacare. I found that Obamacare is not uh, so popular around here, too. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, there are different uh, debates. Uh, uh, I hope that all this uh, trade issue could be one of the areas where there could be a bipartisan support. Last night, um, I had a good uh, dinner with uh, Senator Orrin Hatch, uh, who is uh, uh, from uh, this state. And, uh, and uh, he, I talked with him. He's leading the debate uh, as the chairman of the uh, Senate uh, Finance uh, Committee. And uh, I asked uh, uh, the, his own thinking about uh, this, pro this issue. He was very strong and positive telling me that uh, he's uh, making best effort to get this trade promotion authority uh, bill and present it uh, to the committee after all this uh, recess uh, is over and uh, going back to uh, uh, to Washington uh, he's uh, he would like to see all this uh, uh, trade promotion authority bill will be uh, worked out now, um, I would uh, talk a bit about uh, our relationship uh, on the security side. Um, yeah, uh, on this point, there are two dimensions important I'd like to uh, address, and they are, are making progress. Uh, one is an effort now underway uh, to uh, redistribute American forces in Asia-Pacific regions. 
Uh, there was a plan agreed uh, to reduce the American Marine Forces uh, in Okinawa from 19,000 to roughly uh, 10,000. Uh, there are more than um, 50,000 uh, American uh, military personnel stationed in Japan. It's a, it's a huge number, uh, uh, possibly more than the uh, Michelin people you have in Japan. Uh, uh, but uh, me, uh, this is uh, 70% of American uh, military presence in Japan is focused on Okinawa because Okinawa is a strategically important uh, part uh, from which you could have access uh, to uh, various parts of the region, whether it is Korean Peninsula or Taiwan, Philippines, or other parts in the region. So uh, militarily, Okinawa continue to play an important role. And, uh, but um, as I said it, uh, Okinawa people, uh, since every day they see all these military aircraft uh, flying over them, and let, there are lots of uh, noises and so forth. Sometimes there are accidents and so forth. Uh, so they like to see the reductions of, of this uh, number of the people stationed there. And so that, um, you know, um, they could have all the, some of the land returned to them and take advantage of all this uh, reduced footprint of American forces in Okinawa. But we have to do this without uh, reducing or hurting uh, resilience of American forces and American presence and American deterrence uh, in the region. And, um, um, and it is not uh, necessarily easy because there is a sentiment, a uh, feeling of Okinawa people. Some of you might have uh, visited Okinawa, possibly. And this is a unique uh, place in the history. And uh, uh, they, were, they had an ind independent kingdom of their own old days. And, and they became part of Japan uh, you know, uh, more than three or four, four centuries ago. And, uh, but um, they, um, although we, uh, we need to have a good understanding of Okinawa, there are also politics involved. You know, all the politics are basically local, unless we could uh, pay sufficient attention to uh, all this uh, sentiment and those people who represent Okinawa. And I think uh, this uh, might uh, cause a problem. And that's why I think uh, we continue to have uh, uh, dialogue with them so that we could get understanding of these people. And um, this is not easy, but uh, this uh, we have to do and stay on the course. Mm. I don't get too much in detail about how, how uh, American uh, uh, forces distribution is taking place. But I want, just want to say that uh, we need uh, more cost-effective, operationally viable American presence in the region, uh, uh, having Japan as a pivot uh, of the alliance. Um, now, let me uh, talk a bit about uh, another dimension of the security policy of Japan. Um, in Japan, there is a debate on, on government uh, security policy uh, that has been going on uh, for some time. Uh, Prime Minister Abe um, has changed the interpretations of the Constitution. Uh, someone might uh, know, possibly you. Japanese Constitution was drafted by American uh, occupation forces after the war. There are lots of uh, liberal uh, people uh, within occupation. Uh, you know, forces, and uh, they came up with the uh, most, uh, you know, peaceful uh, constitutions uh, uh, in the world. And um, they, uh, uh, they thought that uh, Japan could live uh, without uh, military force. 
uh, without the right to fight a war and so forth. But later on, they we found that this was not practical. There was Cold War going on between the America and the Soviet unions, and uh, Japan was part of American uh, policy uh, toward the Soviet Union. So uh, we were rather suggested to create our own self-defense force so that we could share of our own work to defend the countries. But uh, throughout the years, uh, we basically uh, didn't mobilize our self-defense force externally. It's uh, basically defense only. And uh, we, uh, we, uh, we, uh, we interpreted constitution that uh, we are not allowed to exercise the so-called collective defense. Collective defense means that uh, you would fight for the country other than uh, yours. And, uh, and so we have restrained ourselves even uh, when the American uh, forces are, are challenged by the others. We can't really be fighting together with America. That's the interpretation of the Constitution because we, we thought that this would not be allowed under the interpretation of the Constitution. So the Prime Minister, against the changing background of security circumstances in Asia Pacific, that include increasing North Korean threat, missile threat, and uh, nuclear bomb development, and, and also hacking. You know the Sony pictures, uh, hacking. Did you ever see all these Sony uh, uh, pictures movie? Nah, right? Uh, so it's not, I don't say it's not a worthwhile to watch all these, uh, you know, Sony movies, but uh, it's basically, uh, you know, uh, caricature of North Korea. And all these leaders, the head is blown away and, and so forth. They were infuriated, so they decided to hack and uh, do something funny. But um, this North Korea continued to be a uh, source of concern, to be honest. They have uh, uh, quite uh, many of long, uh, medium and long-range missiles which could reach Japan. If they shoot to more than 200 missiles at once, we are uh, not immune uh, to, uh, to be suffering. And so we have to introduce more robust uh, you know, uh, defense, including uh, introductions of uh, missile defense against a possible North Korean attack. And, and, um, and we are working uh, to deepen our alliance with the United States on how to defend uh, the situations. And, um, but uh, coming back to this uh, you know, collective defense issues, uh, the prime minister and the government is now working uh, to introduce the bill uh, of, uh, to enable the government to exercise this collective defense. And if that would happen uh, this year, hopefully, and uh, uh, before the summer, uh, Japanese self-defense force uh, will be able to operate together with the United States forces in the region in the event of contingency. Uh, our function is more of the supportive, not necessarily in the forefront of fighting. And also um, in terms of uh, global uh, peace, you know, the peacekeeping operations, uh, you know, uh, exercised by United Nations and others so far. We are also restrained in sending our forces for uh, peacekeeping operation, not an invasion purpose, peacekeeping. Even for that, we have restrained ourselves. So as a result of all this overhauling of uh, security legislations, we will be able to do more uh, for the international peace and security. That's what uh, we are going to do. And also that is consistent with the objective of the Japan-U.S. alliance. And um, on the defense side, uh, you know, um, there are other uh, good collaboration taking place between Japan and the United States, like uh, outer space. 
these days, as you know, um, some countries around Japan are uh, testing long-range missile, uh, shooting uh, satellites, or, uh, and uh, there are debris and so forth. And so uh, we have to do more work uh, to prepare for the future, uh, you know, uh, uh, contentions in outer space. Yeah, as you know, there are cyber attacks and hacking uh, from uh, from uh, some countries, uh, not only limited to uh, uh, North Korea, but also to China. So that is a growing concern. These have to be dealt uh, with by increasing technological and institutional infrastructure building, and especially between Jap Japan and the United States. These are the areas where we are already increasing our resources and will do for years to come. Let me talk a bit about uh, our, how our policy collaboration is uh, shaping up. Uh, you know, in the a Asia uh, Pacific region, we obviously have many challenges. Uh, uh, as I said to you, North Korea continued to be a source of uh, a threat and concern. And, uh, and their problems are, uh, have actually uh, continued more than two decades. It's there, and the level of concern is on the rise. And as you know, possibly we negotiated with North Korea many times. I myself uh, was involved with uh, negotiating with uh, North Korean uh, representative, whether that was through a uh, so-called six-party talk involving America, Russia, China, Japan, and South Korea, or uh, bilaterally uh, with North Korea. And I spend uh, so much energy uh, on these uh, talks with North Korean. After I, I, I left uh, the job, and I, I got sick, to be honest. And my wife was very much worried. And uh, I spent too much energy on that one and was not successful. When you are not successful, you know, you don't feel great, right, obviously. So uh, that's it. And, um, you know, um, there were negotiations, uh, try, and every time, uh, there is a suspension of negotiations and retreating and repetitions of all this uh, negotiation. So there is a sense of, uh, I don't say, uh, fatigue and even caution. Should we uh, get into negotiation with North Korea once again? Uh, the leadership there is not necessarily ideal. Uh, people think that way. Uh, and so the, there are several debates, even in Washington and Tokyo, how we would do. One school of the thought is that uh, pressure is not enough. And there are sanctions in place, like uh, we have done vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Iran. Uh, you, you know, in case of Iran, people believe that it's uh, making impact. And there are now uh, negotiation undertaken, final negotiation possibly. Uh, and I hope that will be successful. But on the North Korean case, uh, I think uh, we are not quite sure that uh, they are seriously uh, coming into negotiating table. So the argument goes that uh, we need to put more pressure and sanction. But here, the China uh, plays a very important role because North Korean survival is very much related to Chinese support, economic support, basically. And uh, we asked China to, uh, to play a more, uh, you know, a role to convince North Korea coming to negotiating table seriously. I think they have tried, but uh, the question is that, uh, is that sufficient? And so I think uh, there are some arguments going on. The other part of the argument is that uh, whatever the uh, negotiations or the, the policy delivery might be, you have to talk. Unless you, you talk, it's hard uh, to, uh, to have a negotiated result. And uh, this school suggests that uh, without uh, any precondition, 
you need to sit on the, that table and talk and to find a way out and to move forward uh, step by step. And um, at this moment, uh, I think the, uh, the argument is more on the, um, the first, and then people are, are still waiting and waiting for the North Korea, I feel like uh, uh, talking seriously. And uh, we really don't know. I don't know either. But uh, I just want to say that uh, this is a huge problem. Uh, Iran, people say it's a serious problem, but they haven't even developed nuclear weapons. <coughs> they, are, they were trying before. The exercise is now undertaken to stop it and prevent it. That the issues uh, of uh, the people are now uh, tackling. But when it comes to North Korean case, I mean, uh, they have already have a nuclear bomb and possibly weapons. So it's uh, quite a dangerous situation. Now, um, I, uh, I like to uh, say a few words about the relationship uh, with the Republic of uh, Korea. You know, um, uh, Professor uh, Rasen is a quite expert uh, on uh, Korean affairs, uh, and uh, he is teaching history. Uh, I'm uh, one time I was uh, a director uh, for Korean affairs, uh, younger days. So I spent uh, some time dealing with our Korean friends, and. Um, we have a bit tensions with our friends and Korean f government at this moment uh, uh, coming uh, from the dispute, uh, basically on the history issues and, and also sometimes uh, you know, uh, disputed uh, territorial issues. There are small islands uh, in the water between us. And, but um, <coughs> These are not necessarily new. Uh, some of you might uh, know that uh, we open up a uh, diplomatic relationship uh, with uh, ROK 1965. It's a long time ago. Uh, we, are, uh, we, we had a legal document uh, where all the claims uh, before, uh, during, after the war, up until that time was settled and uh, legally. And, but there were these issues of uh, sentiment, scars of the war. You can't heal all this uh, past history with just one simple document. It's, uh, it's a generational. And uh, we are well aware of that. And back in 1998, I think uh, there was a Korean uh, president, his name was Kim Tae-jun, uh, who was, by the way, Christian. And uh, he had gone through a difficult political uh, vicissitude in Korea. He was in prison, and he had gone through a difficult time. But he had a great vision. He had a great ambition to open the country. and. Um, he decided to allow Korean people uh, to enjoy Japanese things and Japanese songs and so forth. Up until that moment, Japanese songs were not allowed uh, to be on air. So all these things were open up, and then there was a good declaration, written doc document, and President uh, Kim uh, delivered a wonderful speech to, to the Japanese parliament diet, we call. Uh, he, uh, he said that uh, we agreed to reconcile. Mm, let's move ahead. Uh, we will not raise the issue of history in the future. Let's move. That was great. So we thought that all the issues were settled, more or less politically this time. But later on, uh, there were different kinds of government coming to power, and the uh, issues are still there. So um, there is a sense of uh, fatigue uh, in Tokyo. 
But having said it, I think uh, uh, since Korea is matters a lot, they, they are a very important uh, friend uh, to us. We like to maintain and strengthen the relationship with them. And so we are addressing once again this issue with a uh, uh, humble uh, mindset uh, to explore what we can do together with the uh, Korean government. Um, now, um, am I speaking too long? It's still okay? All right, okay. Um, I'd like to talk a bit about uh, China. As you know, China is rising economically and even militarily in these days. And there is a good discussion uh, underway between Tokyo and uh, Washington on uh, how to deal with uh, this rise of China. Uh, in the, not in the context of making enemy out of China, but more in the context of what we can do uh, to, uh, together uh, to have China uh, cooperating uh, building good uh, relationship and partnership uh, with us. And, uh, and I think there is a common strategic interest uh, between Japan and the United States in getting, in getting this done. Uh, obviously, we would like to see a Chinese economy continue to grow. Our trade relationship uh, with China respect respectively, uh, actually Japanese trade with China and American trade with China is more than Japan and trade with the United States today. So we, we can't really disregard all this uh, great Chinese potential for our economic life. And uh, although Chinese economy is now slowing down a bit, we hope that uh, there will be a uh, soft landing, not a hard landing, you know, uh, and they were uh, growing for many years, but every country had the time uh, to stabilize uh, the growth. As the United States and we and Europe had seen, and you can't uh, register two-digit growth every year. I mean, uh, that's natural. So China is coming into that phase now. And uh, uh, I think their problem is how to address all this uh, problem coming out from the massive economic development. Environment is one thing. If you have visited, uh, you know, Beijing, you can't uh, hear breeze. I mean, uh, all this uh, pollution is everywhere. And uh, that's a result of uh, rapid economic growth. So I think they are getting serious about addressing this issue. And also there is a gap between rich and poor uh, especially those in the city area and rural agricultural areas. There are demonstrations, uh, tens of thousands of, uh, you know, strikes, in the, you know, every year. And uh, the, not all of them are reported, but uh, I think there is some uh, frustration there. And, and also the, the all this, uh, you know, um, policy, uh, for uh, economically uh, freedom, uh, free uh, capital market system, and politically uh, uh, communist uh, dominant uh, uh, regime. Uh, is that uh, workable? That is some of the questions the historian, the political scientists uh, like him are addressing. And uh, we don't know the answer, to be honest. I don't know either. But uh, Chinese government at this moment is believing that, uh, that they could sustain a uh, unique Chinese uh, political system uh, together with uh, uh, open and, and liberal uh, economic system they are trying to develop now. And uh, it's rather Chinese people to think uh, what would be the best for them. But uh, I think the uh, current uh, problem, the uh, strategic issues we have to address are, is not necessarily this economic issue. It's more about their external uh, posture. Uh, 
and also uh, a military build up. Uh, as a result of uh, economic growth and development, they have now uh, putting all these uh, resources to uh, military building and building a lot of uh, aircraft, car aircraft and carriers. And Japan doesn't have any aircraft carrier. Uh, also, uh, America has a seventh fleet, uh, as you know, uh, uh, quite a number of uh, aircraft carrier, but we don't have it. That's why we need to keep a good relationship and strengthen the relationship with the United States to counter any future threat. Uh, we don't perceive the threat yet so seriously. This is if still. So we like to, uh, to uh, prepare uh, for that. And, um, and that's why uh, Americans' uh, um, presence is important. And, um, and another concern about Chinese uh, external posture is its increasing, uh, I would say, assertiveness on the, their right on the maritime domain. And I think uh, uh, they were <coughs> developing their own claim over the uh, little uh, island in South China Sea, and uh, they are increasing tensions over the uh, on, uh, Japanese uh, territory like Senkaku Islands. And uh, this, these tensions, uh, uh, both in South Ch China Sea and the East China Sea, coming from the same source. And they believe that uh, uh, you know, historically, these are the Chinese territory without any legal ground or whatever. They don't show any legal basis. I don't get into too much detail, perhaps we are required another one hour to lecture you on the history of all this uh, conflict and debate. But point is that um, all these uh, posture, assertive posture are frightening. Uh, the neighbors, those countries around them, whether it is small or big, and especially a uh, country like Vietnam and the Philippines are directly uh, facing with this increasing assertiveness of China. So uh, we hope uh, that we could convince uh, Chinese leadership. It's not simply uh, hurting uh, their own uh, reputational cost. It's hurting. Uh, some of the uh, you know uh, relationship, constructive relationship possibility we like to pursue with them. So uh, I think they need to define their policy intentions and goal with transparency, and uh, you know how much they are going to build up their military arsenal. What's the limit of that, if there is any? And what are the, their uh, ambition and goal in the region? Are they ready to restrain some of all this uh, build up? We don't know. So that's why I think we need to be engaged in discussing with Chinese, not only between the government, but also service to service people. And uh, uh, for the first time some years, um, we are talking about uh, possible hotlines with Chinese uh, service. And the problem is that uh, even if there is a hotline, they tend not to use it when we need it. <laughs> so I think we need to get into practice uh, how we would operate it. Well, I have spoken so much, uh, but uh, let me say a few words about this uh, sad portions of the relationship. Uh, you know, um, this. Uh, bonds and kizuna of the people. And um, I see more uh, free and uh, candid discussions uh, taking place, not only between the uh, leaders, uh, president and prime minister, and also uh, uh, you know, between the two government departments, every level, every day, we, we have a good relationship. And uh, that's good things uh, to see as ambassador. But uh, more importantly, uh, 
and on the people-to-people. Um, -people. That is, uh, that, is that matters. And uh, not only uh, congressmen and senators going back and forth. Uh, we see more senators and congressmen going and visiting Japan because of uh, some growing uh, you know, recovery of Japan, and Japan was uh, missing razor screen for some years. It's coming back again. Uh, let's go and see what's happening. That's a good thing for us to see. And um, all those fears are growing. And our 55 members of uh, Congress uh, visited Japan last year. Uh, from Japan, 166 uh, diet members, congressmen, visited uh, United States last year. It's pity that uh, most of them didn't come to uh, this uh, Salt Lake City. I mean, and uh, did anyone? Yeah, there were some, right, coming over. But uh, I would uh, encourage them to come over to this state to see. This is the amazing city I found out. There is a growing, you know, industries. Not only tourism. We know about this. Uh, Praise for the uh, Olympic, Salt Lake uh, Olympic. Uh, but uh, increasingly, I was talking with Senator Hachi last night. There is this uh, medical and high tech uh, coming. And he was uh, very much assertive on the importance of uh, protecting intellectual property. And so uh, we do understand. And I would like to see more of the Japanese coming. Uh, uh, Japanese companies coming to uh, the state of Utah. And as a result of this uh, Trans-Pacific uh, negotiations, I think there will be a more opportunity for the Japanese company uh, coming to the United States, vice versa. But I will tell you, uh, for the first time mm, in the consecutive two years, Japanese investment into the United States became number one, surpassing United Kingdom. United Kingdom has been the number one foreign investor in the United States for many years. But since uh, this uh, two years, Japan is the number one investor. Uh, the, the yearly year, uh, the uh, 38 or 40 billion dollars investments are taking place now uh, from, from Japan. And up until year 2012, the cumulative investment was in the order of 400 billion. So just one year, I mean, uh, uh, just uh, the 10% roughly, it's taking place. So the, uh, I wish that the Japanese company will come to this state and, uh, and um, have a good partnership with you. Uh, and uh, and more, more importantly, and there are exchanges of people, especially I know that uh, there are lots of missionary. I just visited this uh, training center uh, this uh, morning. All these uh, missionary people are visiting, and there are even Japanese uh, you know, uh, people are coming and studying, and all this would work to make more uh, Japanese, uh, ordinary people interested in the state and Salt Lake and coming over. And I, uh, I was very much uh, impressed with the kindness and warm welcome, uh, you know, extended to me and Novikor and meeting here. And um, I, uh, I visited uh, all this, uh, you know, LDS uh, uh, places uh, like uh, Temple Square, and uh, this is a place, uh, uh, monument uh, up in the mountains, and, uh, and I came to know better about this place. And, uh, <coughs> and I'd like to see more uh, Japanese uh, coming to this land. And, uh, it was amazing, uh, more than centuries ago, uh, people came to this place and developed and uh, with uh, industries, you know, this industrial. Yes. Uh, 
beehives. There are, I didn't find any beehive around the town, <laughs> but uh, and it's great. I mean, you know, and uh, we feel more uh, commonality. And Japanese people are also basically hardworking people. And at least our, ge our generation used to be. I mean, uh, <laughs> I don't know younger generation these days, but uh, you know, um, I'd like to see more of that uh, happening. And um, <clears throat> uh, later next month, Japanese Prime Minister Abe is visiting the United States as an official guest uh, of the uh, president. As ambassador, I'm getting busy, but I'm happy uh, to see that. Uh, and the Prime Minister is going to address before the joint uh, meeting of the Congress, and uh, he would address the alliance of the past, present, and the future. He wouldn't say the same things as I told you today. He would say something uh, more noble and great. And, uh, but uh, I think one thing is common. That is the importance of the relationship and alliance between Japan and the United States. And uh, Mike uh, Mansfield, ambassador, uh, who used to be here from Montana. He was a Senate, and he was ambassador to Japan uh, in old days. He said that there is uh, the most uh, important bilateral relationship is Japan-U.S. relationship, but none, he said it. So uh, we are, uh, there are a lot of uh, challenges, obviously. There are decreasing number of students, for example, uh, because of uh, the population decrease of Japan, and uh, we are trying to rebound, reverse that trend. I like to see more Japanese students coming to Salt Lake City and Utah. There are lots of exchange program, and uh, I, I like you also. Uh, you know, uh, go to Japan even if you have lived in Japan before or. Uh, especially for those who never been in Japan, uh, we would welcome you to coming over and see how Japan is doing and to feel, uh, uh, you know, uh, good friendship uh, from Japanese people to you. Now, thank you very much. I would close here and I take questions. <laughs>